So uh, you recall that last time. So we've, uh, in terms of the big picture, uh, the very big picture is that we're talking about these different processes that can occur. Fluid pressure we chose because it's the easiest of the systems. One, because there's one uh, degree of freedom per node, representing a scalar value, which is pressure. And secondly, uh, because it doesn't involve an extra term in terms of behavior, in other words, advection, it includes only this fluid pressure diffusion term, which is governed by Darcy's law. So the equations are the simplest of the set of equations that we have. But the equations for uh, fluid pressure diffusion, fluid flow, are very similar to those for heat flow and those for contaminant transport. They all um, center around the idea that the behavior is controlled by these governing constitutive laws, Darcy's law for fluid flow, uh, Fourier's law for heat transport, for conductive heat transport, and uh, Fick's law for diffusive transport, all acting on a scalar value. And so everything that we're doing now can be applied to, to those. Uh, we'll look at solid mechanics as well in terms of deformation. Our idea is to be able to define the behavior for each of these systems individually. And so uh, we're working our way through this uh, in defining the localization method. And the localization method is that we define the body into elements. And those elements we then use to be able to figure out exactly what the um, conductance matrix is that, that links those. And so we know that when we're dealing with this, we, we're always dealing with a system of equations which looks something like... Um, you, sh you can tell me if whether this is too small or too large. Just right. The Goldilocks zone. And we know that these conductance matrices in this particular case look something like this. You'll be tired of these expressions uh, by the time you finish. If not already, actually. <laughs> and uh, for these, uh, we know that so long as we can generate these relationships for Darcy's law, which is what this term is, that links a nodal value of gradient of head. And so if we want to write it out in two dimensions, we can do that. It's just dh dx dh dy <coughs> for convenience we can uh, write only the on diagonal terms which would be hydraulic conductivity in the x direction hydraulic conductivity in the y direction I think we kind of talked about that when you have looked at the stuff for the triangular elements and that is that gives us a velocity in x and a velocity in y. And so the two important expressions we have to deal with are a constitutive relationship, which is Darcy's law. So this clearly is D. Could have off-diagonal terms as well, but let's not complicate our lives with that. And also a relationship which allows us to link, for instance, uh, magnitudes of heads to gradients of heads. So in the same way that we write a shorthand for this, clearly this H comma term is these head gradients, then the A matrix allows us to calculate the gradients of head, again in two-dimensional cases in both X and Y. As a function of an A matrix um, times, for instance, if it's a triangle element, with three nodes, I, J. We didn't use K because of confusion with permeability. Think of them. And then this would be H, I. H, J, and H, M. 
Um, we know by definition that if this is a matrix that links a vector of three terms with a vector of two terms, then in terms of rows and columns, this would be two rows taken from this two by one. This is, um, this is two rows and one column. This is three rows and one column. And so this would be two rows and uh, three columns. So in other words, it takes each of these two terms together to go into this. So, so it would look like, if you want to draw it out, two rows would be this, and these are the three columns. So this is just what this matrix would look like. And so um, we know how to do this for a triangular element. We know how to do it for one-dimensional elements because it, it, uh, we know exactly what this stuff thinks. And so in, in our shorthand, I suppose, we would call this as h, comma, is equal to a h. These are nodal values of, of head that we have, which are these for the element, and these are gradients. And so we talked about when we want to do more complex elements that what we might like to do is that instead of writing this relationship out in this form, uh, we can transform it. And if we do that, the transformation ends up, I'll write it out again just, just to be, so in other words, it goes from integral A transpose DA, where we've defined these matrices before, evaluated over, um, let's do it in three, uh, let's do it in two dimensions, just because our other stuff is done that way. And what we'd like to be able to do is write it so that we replace this in some way with a, a proxy, and a proxy to represent the fact that we're stretching it from the true system, or compressing it from the true system onto this by unit square, we do the integrations, and then that's our matrix. And so our real transformation is to do this. It doesn't look any different yet, but we have this multiplier, and we have these coordinates, dr and ds. And it could well be, it's not going to be very easy. I'll do it not as a triangular element, but it could be an element that looks like this globally with four nodes that is defined in terms of uh, x and y and we want to be able to parse that if you like onto this so-called by unit square that has um, the coordinate system which is r and s and this is plus one, plus one, in terms of coordinates, and the other ones follow. And so there are a couple of things that we need to be able to, to accommodate. We need to figure out exactly, this is a, a vector in this case, the question is, what is this when we look at more complicated systems? And uh, you could imagine, uh, yeah, okay, so that's one thing. And the other component is, how do we get these matrices, which we want to be able to link nodal values of head to gradients of those heads, which are really used in Darcy's law, but these are in terms of global coordinate systems, not the local coordinate systems. We know how to get quite easily terms like dh, dr, which we did last time, and we know quite easily how to get terms like d, a, d, uh, uh, dx, dr, because we know that we can write these x coordinates as something like the location at any point is equal to the shape function vector multiplied through by um, the x coordinate vector. Likewise, the h vector is at any, the head at any point is equal to the shape functions which map the heads multiplied by the 
nodal vector. So we can always get terms like this. But we want terms that look like this. And so our, our, our um, challenge, I guess, is in, in two ways. One is to figure out how to calculate the A matrix, not in terms of, uh, we want it in terms of D, DX, but we only know how to get it in terms of DDR. And likewise, this um, Jacobian vector has the same issue. We can evaluate it quite easily in terms of local coordinates, but we need to make this transformation into global coordinates. So those are the two things that we'll we'll deal with today. Today is well, sorry. One thing is we'll deal with how how to figure out how to make this mapping. Uh, this uh, integration, by the way, is between uh, plus and minus one in each of these, I suppose. And so the one thing is how to make this transformation in, in space to be able to accommodate the stretching or sc squeezing. And the second one is that if we have this geometry, which is no longer on this by unit square, uh, how do we do the integrations to be able to do an example, which isn't a very simple, uh, straightforward example that we did last time. Yeah. And so those are the two things we'll do. So to do those, we need two tools. Uh, the first tool is to figure out exactly what numerical integration is. And the second one is how to figure out how to do this for two-dimensional elements, where it follows directly from what we did last time, but it gets a bit more complicated. Uh, so, uh, so those are the two things. So first, numerical integration. Um, it is a relatively simple concept. Uh, the basic idea is that if you think about having a, uh, yeah, it's a very simple concept. And maybe it's best to just illustrate what the concept is uh, before we even talk about the, uh, identifying it. So for instance, if you have a function that you wanted to define, let's say this function is r squared. And we plot the value of this function y equals r squared. <coughs> then we know that when y is equal to 0, it's 0. We know that when y is equal to 1, it's equal to 1. And we think that the uh, expression looks something like this. So this is plus 1. Uh, then the magnitude of this will be equal to 1. Uh, when it's negative 1, because it's squared, it has this very interesting property. If I can draw a mirror of this, the function just looks like this. So you could imagine, maybe, that this uh, function, evaluated at both of these points, uh, could be a shape function. Right? It has the same shape as a shape function. The definition of an integral uh, is merely the... I'm not going to keep this shading and get rid of it but it's merely the area that exists underneath this um, curve. That's the definition of this. It's between plus and minus 1. It's, it's nothing more than that. And so if I come back to do this, then you could imagine trying to evaluate that integral in a couple of different ways. One straightforward way would just, well, the way to do it would be just choose a magnitude of where that that function is uh, evaluated and multiply it by the width. So the first way to do it might be to take the value of the function at this point uh, in and just multiply the value of that function, which will be 0, multiplied by the length across here. And so in other words, evaluate the function at r equals 0. <coughs> that function therefore would give you, uh, r, r squared at 0 would give you a value of 0. And then you multiply it by the weight, which is the width of this thing, which is this. And you multiply the two by uh, each other, and you end up with a value of 0 for this integral, which was the area that we shaped, which is clearly not a very good uh, approximation of this. An alternative way to do that is to, instead of evaluating it at this blue dot, which will just disappear below before your eyes, uh, is to evaluate it, I'm going to use a deeper blue, at some other places. 
So what you could do is you could choose for some reason to evaluate this function for a reason that will become plain later at plus 0.577. It's thinking. In which case the value of the function would be this dot here. And if you evaluate that function here, it would be the area under the presumed curve would be this. And if you evaluate it also at minus 0.577, then you get exactly the same result on the other side. And so the value of this at uh, r squared times 0.57, so 0.577 squared, so the function evaluated at plus 0.5777 would be um, 0 0.577 all squared. In other words, that, that would be the height of this thing here. And the width of this, the tributary area of this, would be 1, because it is between 0 and minus 1. And I guess this is this term, actually, isn't it? The function of value at that point is minus 0.577 squared. The value evaluated at, on the right-hand side is plus 0.577 squared. And you multiply it by the weighting, and you get a value of 0.66. If you uh, wanted to be uh, even smarter, you could then go and do this. Instead of evaluating it at two points, you could do it at three points. And I'm running out of daylight, of course, on that. But actually, this doesn't work too badly. It gets rid of it quite quickly. I'm cheating a bit because I'm reusing it. So if you evaluated it at three points and went back to it, then you'd have to figure out what those three points would be. And I can't remember what they were, but I'm going to look at a table in a second. I think it's 0.866, but let's have a look. Point 0.775. So the alternative would be that you could evaluate it at some optimal point. And I'm making up these optimal points. And what did I say it was? This is this number here, 0.775. It doesn't like to do this. It's kind of interesting. Plus, which would be this value here, and minus 0.775 which is this point here, symmetric again, but also evaluated at zero. And if you could figure out some particular weights to give it, which aren't obvious, but I'm just going to choose a random width. And that random width is going to be 0 0.555 recurring. And this one also is the same width. Then again, you can calculate this integral, which would just be the area in this block, the area in this block, which is 0, and the area in this block. And so in this particular case, um, we could do the math. And the math would be um, that i is equal to the function evaluated at 0.775, so it's plus 0 0.775. The function is squared, r squared, and it's multiplied by this weight, so it's times 0 0.55. We calculate the value at this point and add it to it, which is 0 squared, multiplied by a different weight, which is 0.888. And the final one would be this term here, which is the function evaluated at minus 0 0.775 and multiplied by the same weight.
0 0.55. And I think if you did that, you'd find out that it would also equal this. You can do the math, and I, I won't do it, but you'd find out that it also uh, replicated this previous value. If you do the integral, what you get, actually, just out of interest? R squared should be a third R cubed evaluated between uh, minus 1 and plus 1. And so for plus 1, that would be equal to 1 divided by 3. I think it's going to work out. For minus 1, it would be um, minus 1 cubed, which is also which is plus 1, right? Which is r squared, which would be, yeah, so it's and multiplied by a third which is indeed, I was going to write 1 over 6, but of course it's not, which is exactly this. So that's the exact solution. And so that's all num numerical integration is. You take uh, a place where you want to evaluate uh, your function, you calculate what the magnitude is, you multiply it by a particular weight, and as you get more and more of these blocks, you can imagine that uh, you'll better progressively better and better approximate the curve that you want to approximate um, which is this curve here and so you can imagine that if you take more and more blocks then the skyscrapers start filling the the region exactly just like Simpson's rule that you'd have learned sometime in your uh, distant past and that's it Although there's one thing that's apparent from this example, and that is that once you get beyond a certain resolution, you actually don't improve the result, even though you're putting more effort into it. So here we did this with uh, two calculations, two products, a calculation of the function at one location times the weight, a calculation at another location times the weight for two-point quadrature. Um, when we used it for three-point quadrature, which I got rid of. Then we calculated a function at a point three times and multiplied it by three slightly different weights. And so we used half as much effort to get this one as we did for this, uh, but we got exactly the same result. And so probably we don't want to do that. And so uh, numerical quadrature just gives us a rational way of being able to calculate, integrate uh, functions, quadratic functions, um, and to to be able to yeah, we'll get rid of that, and to be able to rationalize exactly uh, what level of information, uh, how many times you, we need, need to do it. So the quadrature function is this. Uh, you'll have seen it on the next page, which we'll deal with. And so to integrate any function, it can be any function, but it works best for quadratics because the locations where you take these sampling points are defined. Uh, uniquely for quadratics and you can get the integral merely by taking the magnitude of the function calculated at these points, Gauss points, integration points, uh, and multiplied by a tributary area or a weight factor, right? So the weight factor is just this length here and the magnitude of the function evaluated at that particular location is this. So I guess this is this would be the function at location AJ. So this would be the Gauss point, and this would be the function evaluated at that point. And this here would be the weight, the so-called weight, HJ, so in this function. And so uh, it's useful to know, and it comes out directly from what we've talked about here, is that at some stage it doesn't do us any benefit in actually using a higher order of quadrature. And that's borne out in this statement, which I'll just read out. So quadrature, which is a fancy name for numerical integration. So this and this are the same. Uh, quadrature, because it's on quadratic functions, it gives the exact result to rounding error anyway. If the degree of the function k is less than or equal to 2n minus 1, where n is the order of integration. So the order of integration that we've used is n equals 1 n equals 2, and n equals 3. So I guess we can test that out. This is the idea of a function. So this is a quadratic function up to this point, right? A constant, 
a linear function, a quadratic, a cubic would be the cube terms, etc., to the power of k. And so if we work out the magnitude of this, so in our particular case, our function is k is equal to 1. Yes. And so if we used we used n equals 1, gave us this value here of uh, 2 minus 1, which gave us 1. We used n equals 2, which gives us the value again of this function of 2 times 2 is 4, minus 1 is 3. And we used n equals 3, which gives us uh, 2 times 3 is 6, minus 1, which is 5. And so long as our function is um, less than, so we, we fit right here. This is, this, uh, is k, right? I'm overwriting this. So the values in this column are the degree of the polynomial. So in other words, to calculate the value for a constant, we can use a n equals 1 and get that exact number. If we want to get it for a quadratic, k equals 2, we need to use n equals 2, and indeed that works for us just fine. If we use n equals 3, we also get the exact result as well, but we've, it's overkill because you didn't need it. If we wanted to calculate the behavior for a term that had a cubic in it, a3 times r to the power of 3, then it turns out that using n equals 2 would be just fine as well uh, to get that value. And so it doesn't go up linearly, but uh, we can choose exactly the magnitude that we want to use to be able to do it. We don't need to completely fill the, the interval with all of these skyscrapers because at some stage, because these points, these integration points, are chosen uh, exactly, uh, they give us the exact result. And so to do this, you need a table of uh, abscissae and weights. And so you saw that when we did this, if you calculated the value of the function in the center, So the function can be anything, right? So the function could be anything. Um, and if this is, well, we've called it r. If you want to calculate it for one-point quadrature, you evaluate it here. This is plus 1. This is minus 1. And then what would the you know that this would be a positive value, this would be a positive value, and this would be subtracted, right, in the integral, because it's negative. Can't get it for r squared, I think, right, because just the nature of the, the function. So the location where you calculated it is here, and you multiply it by this tributary area. If you'd use two points, n equals 2, you use, sorry, 3, n equals 2, the, this is plus or minus this location, so it's plus 5.7, it's minus 0.577, and the tributary areas are 1. If it's 3 points, then uh, 1 is always in the center, and the other two are flanking it, and these are the weights. Uh, you'll notice, of course, that the weights have to add up to 2, right? <coughs> Bless you. This is 2. You do this twice, so this adds up to 2. You do this uh, this one twice, so 2 times this one, which would be 1.1 1 .1 plus 0.9, will give you 2 also, right? For 4-point quadrature, n equals 4. Um, if you double this, 3.5 doubled is 0.7. Um, 6.5 doubled is... 0 0.13, 0 0.13 and 0 0.7 again are equal to, to uh, 2. And so that's basically the idea. Very, very simply, that's what the idea is. And so the 
utility of that, you'll never see it, if, for instance, if you use Comsol. Uh, if you have to write your own uh, elements, you will use it. Uh, but the idea is that you can do the integrations of these functions over some length in one dimension. But you can also do the same thing in two dimensions. So when we calculate this uh, stiffness matrix, so you remember that our conductance matrix is going to look something like A transpose D A Jacobian DX DR, uh, sorry, DRDS, DRDS minus 1 plus 1. minus 1, plus 1. And so this is going to be our conductance matrix. It looks just like this. So the function we want to evaluate is going to be these components that exist within the integration. And they're going to be evaluated over the local coordinate systems. So when we have uh, two dimensions, then we have to do it twice. And so you can think about these. These are the tributary areas that we talked about before. And this is the function evaluated at some very specific Gauss point. And so the Gauss points are, if we're using two-point quadrature, so in other words, n is equal to 2, make this larger, uh, not that large, then the Gauss points would be that you calculate the value exactly at this location. It represents a height above that. And so you multiply it then by the r and the s magnitudes in each of these directions, which is the base of this uh, square here. And the base of the square times the height of that gives you the integral in that segment, that quarter. You do it again at point uh, minus r is, e r is equal to minus 0 0.5777, and s is equal to plus 0 0.577, and it gives you this value here, etc. And you get a second one, which now looks like this, this tributary area. And so you go on. And so the way in which we get these uh, magnitudes is to calculate what the algebraic magnitude of this matrix is at every single point, every single uh, entry in the matrix, and then to do it for the values in the shape functions equal to r equal plus 577 and plus r is equal to plus 577 and s is equal to 577, then do it here, then do it here, then do it here, add those four terms together, and then go on. If you have an element which is more complicated, uh, which might have curvature on the sides, which we made the point last time, then you can't necessarily get away with um, using a straight-sided element. And if you use that, then you might choose to use a larger order of quadrature. In this case, n equals 3 in which case you just do exactly the same. Now the tributary areas are defined again in terms of a Gauss point, because it's Gaussian quadrature after Mr. Gauss, the German mathematician. And they're evaluated at this point, and they're multiplied by a tributary area, and you get a region. And as you get larger and larger magnitudes of quadrature, then you just end up with more effort. So in this case, you have to evaluate four multiplications times some number to get the value. Here you have to do nine, so you've increased it by more than a factor of two. And here you have to do it 16 times. So in going from this to this, you've multiplied your effort by a factor of four. If you like, you know, each one of these areas here with four Gauss points is exactly the same as this right? in terms of activities. And so in the same way as we uh, talked earlier, we'd probably like to know how we can use this little rule which tells us how to get the exact solution. And it's not so easy because as we'll find out, some of the, um, the matrices that we use consist of quadratic terms which are 1 over quadratics. And so it's tough to be able to make this work exactly. But by rules of thumb, by using what other people have known, uh, used by, I guess, by empiricism, by just uh, trial and error, we know something about what kind of quadrature would work. And um, I think uh, Comsol will choose this automatically for you, uh, but you should know about this stuff. If you're using a very simple element with just end, edge uh, corner nodes, 
then you can get by with two, 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 two point quadrature. If you're using one that's quite heavily distorted, it's no longer really a prism anymore, or a parallel sided parallelopede, I guess, you can still get away with this. If you add more nodes to it, in which case the shape functions that we use along a length, uh, as we might find out, might look something like this. Remember what we said about shape functions? They have to look like one at the location uh, where we are and zero at all other points. And so the only way you can get a shape function that is zero here and zero here and is a continuous function is to have something that looks like this. It's moving, it's moving on me. Right? And so this would be the shape function, the area under this curve. This would be negative. And so this clearly isn't a, um, a linear function, it's a quadratic. And even though it's a very simple geometry, which suggests that we could get away with this, the fact that we've used more complex shape functions and therefore we've increased the order of quadrature that we should use, then it's probably not surprising that we need to, to up it. If we have a node, an element that now is no longer a parallelopede, but has both the complexities of the shape functions mapping the dependent variable, which we pressure, but also is distorted, then it turns out that maybe we can still get away with this 3 by 3. And so that's kind of interesting because not only we said that we, when we made more nodes and therefore a more complex shape function, we might have to up it. If we then add an extra layer of complexity onto it by distorting it, then you'd think that we might have to up it again. The reason that we don't have to up it uh, when we go, for instance, from here to here and from here to here is why. Any thoughts? No one can be brave. It relates, I think, to this idea, is that we almost get a step of two, right? So, in other words, if we use at least two-point quadrature, then two-point quadrature is good for a quadratic and a cubic function. Three-point quadrature is going to be good for a quartic and a quintic function, I think. So in other words, we can get the exact result using two-point quadrature for both the quadratic and a cubic function. Uh, we can't switch to do a, a lesser degree of quadrature for a quadratic because all of a sudden we'll get garbage, right? As you remember here, we got garbage when we use one-point quadrature for quadratic. And likewise, uh, if we have three-point quadrature, we get the extra exact result for a function that looks like a quartic, which is four, or a quintic, which is five. And so I think that's the, the, the reason that we kind of skip two, whoops, we skip two at a time. All right. Yeah. Okay. And then if you, yeah. And so instead of using eight nodes, we could also put a node in the middle, which is all well, that's the difference here. And we get by with the same order of quadratures in each of these because nothing has really changed. Actually, you can represent this with basically the same same uh, shape functions. Um, I'm not going to talk about that because I don't need to. Uh, so, so. Two things we said that we might need. One is that when we use these shape functions, we need to know, because we might be doing it on an irregular area that represents this, even though it's mapped, then we need to know something about numerical integration. So we've talked enough about that to be able to understand that. Yeah, any questions? Okay. And the second part is how we might do this if we make a transition for uh, 2D. All right, so let's, uh, since we've spent a decent amount of time on the first part. Let's do this in um, maybe broad brushish strokes. And so sometimes it's actually useful. Sometimes it's actually, sometimes less is more uh, in terms of when you stand back from things. Uh, but this is basically the idea. So instead of a triangular element, we'll use a quadrilateral element, a four-noted element. Um, if we wanted to, we could make a quadrilateral element just by designating, for instance, node 2 and node 1 to be the same physical location. 
So uh, if you imagine, it, if you identified node 2 and node 1 at the same place, it actually collapses to be a three-node element, and we could use the same rationale. But it's, it's uh, simpler not to, 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 um, to look at a triangular element first, but look at a quadrilateral. So this is what the element looks like in its global sense, when it's sitting in x, y. And this is what it looks like locally between uh, plus 1 and minus 1. Uh, the nodes map from 1, 2, 3, and 4. We always number nodes counterclockwise on elements. If you use COMSOL, you won't see this because it doesn't matter, because it does it automatically. Um, the reason is that when we do the transformations, we end up calculating an area of an element, and if you number the nodes clockwise, the area you get for the element is negative. And so it's... Uh, just by, by convention, it's always done counterclockwise. Each of the nodes has a nodal variable, heads, and also, I suppose, has a flux there as well, in or out. Uh, they're also defined by global coordinates, x and y, for nodes 1, 2, 3, and 4. And I suppose from what we knew before, we can calculate the head at any point we want to calculate within the element that has some nodes which are R and S. That's a comma, not a 1. R and S for that point. The head would be just equal to what? It would be equal to the shape functions multiplied by the nodal values of heads. The x-coordinate of that particular point would be equal to, again, the shape functions multiplied by the nodal coordinates, x x, x, and x. And the y-coordinates would be just mapped by the same shape functions. And so this, this is kind of the essence of isoparametric mapping, is that these are the functions that map the v dependent variable from nodal values to any place within the element. These map the nodal values of the coordinates, uh, the coordinates of the nodal values to any point within the element. And so, in other words, if you wanted to find out what the x-coordinate was at this point, which I guess would be here, all we do is we choose whatever the r-value is, whatever the s-value is, we'd calculate what this shape function was for those r and s-values, and we'd use the nodal values, which are these, and immediately it would give us the value for this x-coordinate, which would be this value. So don't overthink things. That's physically what these expressions are allowing us, allowing us to do. Okay? So if we're going to do that, we need to figure out exactly what these uh, shape functions are. Uh, we could do it by some fancy method, um, but we know that if, for instance, we drew this element out in uh, isometric mode, right? That's the right term, I think isometric mode would look like this. And these are the nodes uh, starting at 1, 2, 3, and 4. Then, again, we know what these shape functions are, if we write them out, that the head at any particular location is equal to b1 h1 plus b2 h2 plus b3 h3 plus b4 h4. We know that by definition the shape functions have to be equal to um, one at the node in question. So we know that in a physical sense, uh, again just it's good to get a graphical idea of what's going on, b1 is going to be equal to unity here. It's going to be equal to uh, 0 at this point, 0 at this point, and 0 at this point. And so it will almost be a, it can't be a plane, right? Because a plane can't go through four points. It has to go through this point at 1, elevation 0, 0, and 0. It will actually be a linear system on the edges. 
and I'm not sure I can draw this very well. It'll have to go through this point here. So you can imagine that it's coming to this peak at, the, at node 1. It's going to 0 at nodes 2, 3, and 4. And it has to do that, so it has to have some slight curvature to it. And so that would be what this uh, shape function b1 would look like. When b1 has the coordinates at this point, it'll give you 1. When b1 has the r coordinates equal to this point, it will give you 0. Likewise, these points. b2 will look like 1. B2 would be something that would be height 1 here, if you like. This would be B2. This would be B1. And it would be equal to 0 at the other points. And so we've actually seen something that looks like this uh, before. I don't know whether I can find it in a real hurry. Um, I'm trying to think when it was. It's when we talked about Galerkin, I think. But sometime after this, aha, it's this, right? It's each of these things. So this is uh, exactly, this is B2, unit height here and zero height at all the other nodes. This is B1, unit height here, zero at the other nodes. B3 would be this one here. So, yeah, it's like a tent. A tent where the walls go down through the ground at each of these other locations. And so that's what the shape functions physically are. And so when you think about those applied at a particular point, say point 12 here, then all the contributing shape functions from the other elements that impinge on this point our unity at that value because we localize them individually in each of these individual individual elements. So, let's see if I can find my way back. Hansel and Gretel. Okay. Not bad. Okay, we're almost there. So this is where we are. So, big picture, since we're kind of uh, getting uh, lots of videos online as well, if, you, uh, if we don't quite get there. So, this is what we need to do. We need to figure out exactly what the shape functions are, because they allow us to map things across the system. We choose them just by uh, chance, serendipity shape functions. This is B1. We know it's okay for B1 because B1, the coordinates of, of node 1 are R equals 1 and S equals 1. And so if we take this as R equals 1 and S equals 1, this is equal to 2 times 2, which is 4, divided by 4, which is 1. Um, if we take this value to be at any point other than this, so um, node number 2 going around the system is going to be r is equal to minus 1 and s is equal to plus 1. So r is equal to minus 1, s is equal to plus 1. This uh, cancels out, it's a, a 0, right? This is a 0 times 2 is 0, and so it's equal to 0 at node 2. And so you can basically show that what we started to draw, which I didn't finish off here, is that it's equal to 1 at this point, it's equal to 0 at this point, it's equal to 0 at 3, it's equal to 0 here, and it varies some magnitude in between. Time, in, in between. All right, so big pictures. We have the shape functions. We have the values of the nodal heads, coordinates x and y. It's important to note one thing, and that is that these only physically exist at the nodes in question. As you go away from the node, they don't exist at all. And so they exist only at these points, but as you physically go away from these points, the value of H1 means nothing. And so that, that's the, the first point to know. Because that's the case, then we can do this mapping, which we've talked about before. This is the value of the head at any point in the element, 
as a function of nodal heads, and likewise for the coordinates. If we know when we want to calculate this conductance matrix, we want to get the values of gradients of heads in global coordinates. We want things like dh dx because we know that this is equal to a h, right? The a matrix takes the nodal values of heads, it maps it in some way to give us the gradients of these. We don't have this. We only have components which we can get as dh dx and dr and dr. And so we know how to do this, and we know how to do this from last time. Uh, clearly we can get this because we can get h. We could just substitute this value of h into here. And we could take the derivatives of this. Likewise, we could take the value of x, and we could substitute it into here, and turn it upside down, and do the derivatives with respect to r, because there's only terms within here. But the point is that our values that we can get in this mapping are all values in, in this transformed coordinate system. So let's allow us ourselves to do that. We want to get values of dhdr. We have two, two coordinate dimensions, x and y, and r and s. So if we have these local values, we can have the change in head with the local coordinate in the kind of x direction, which is r, and the local coordinate in the orthogonal direction, which is s. If we substitute in the values that h is equal to b times nodal values of h, these don't exist within the element, and these are the, sh the mapping functions. So that's this. We've just taken this term out here. That's all. Importantly, because these don't exist anywhere, then we can just think of evaluating the derivatives on this term here. And I think we're going to call this term here a matrix P, which is this here. And if we take the derivatives of the shape functions, what's the derivative with respect to R of this shape function? DDR is equal to 1 times 1 plus S. So you lose this term, you get plus 1 plus S. So if you work your way through this and just take the derivatives of those shape functions, first with respect to R, which is the top line, corresponding to this. And then with respect to s, for instance, this differentiated with respect to s, this is going to go to 1. So this is going to be plus 1 plus r with the quarter outside. So this term here. And likewise for the other terms, for those other components. So we know that we can get this um, derivatives of the shape functions. And we can use it to be able to get terms like this. But we don't want terms like this. We want them like this. So the next thing we have to figure out is how we are able to change from derivatives with respect to the local coordinate system, which we know how to get through this, to ones with respect to the global coordinate system. So this is how we uh, do it. We use the chain rule. Um, we could put any term in here we like. It happens to be head. It could be any scalar variable. We want to get the change in head as a function of r. Um, and we know that we can do that by two ways. We know we have it from this. Well, let me, let me just write it up here. We could do this. And we could make this, I'm just going to write out the second, first top equation. We could do this as a change in head with respect to R and a change in head with respect to R. So I've just written out this twice, this derivative. Um, it seems that I'm writing out this is equal to this plus this, but it should give us actually two times this, right? 
But if we evaluate this term with respect by multiplying just by 1, let me, because I can use red, this is just with respect to x, and this is with respect to y. So together, these terms are just equal to multiplying by, by 1. And then we've just transformed this. We haven't made it that this is equal to 2 times this. And the reason we haven't made it equal to that is because x and y are perpendicular to each other. So they have no component of each other's influence that goes in that direction. And so that's why the chain rule doesn't have a, a 2 on this side. And we have the first line of this. If we do the same for this term here, by writing this is dh ds, this is dh ds, this is dh ds, and we're going to multiply by 1, x, and y. If we now take the terms, it's going to get very, it's getting very messy. So now we take the terms which are dh dx and dh dy, which I'm just going to box. Then what we can do is we can kind of take those out of here and write them in this form. So these are the green terms that I've taken here. These are the operators that are left, which exist now in this matrix. And the terms on the left-hand side are the same as the ones before. That's it. And so the interesting thing is, is that this is that now what it allows us to do is couple, well, at least one thing. It allows us to translate from known values of gradients in the global coordinate systems to known to gradients in the local coordinate systems. We kind of want it backwards from that, uh, but bear with us. And if we look at exactly what that looks like, I guess this is this is just the same equation, isn't it? This is the HDS. What we'll do is we'll call this matrix here the Jacobian. So we've had Gauss today. We've had Jacob, another main, famous mathematician, I guess. This is dy. It's cut off here. It's probably fine on your notes. Um, and this Jacobian is the reason for this J matrix that we've talked about, the term Jacobian. And the, the issue is that in this particular case, we can calculate the gradients in the local coordinate system as a function of the global coordinate system. We don't want that. We want the opposite. And so what we could do is we could invert this by multiplying both sides by the inverse of this matrix. We have the matrix here, so we can multiply by the inverse. And if we do that, then this just becomes the identity matrix. Ones and zeros. Ones on the leading diagonal and zeros elsewhere. And if we write this slightly differently, you have equation 10. So equation 10 is that instead of being able to translate global gradients to local gradients, now we can translate local gradients to global gradients, which is what we want. And it's just this. If we know that we can calculate our gradients locally from this previous expression, this, equation 6. So we can substitute equation 6 in for this term here. And if we do that, we have this. So this part here is equation 6. So, lots of jumping around. Um, so, so long as we can calculate what this, so long as we can do two things. So long as we can get the terms that live in this equation, which I think we can, right? We know that x, for instance, would be equal to shape function multiplied by nodal coordinates. And so we can get the derivatives of the shape functions, and so we can get this the values that go into here. So we can get all the values of dx, dy, all of these terms. Uh, we can invert this matrix. 
And so the inversion of this matrix is that just, you probably know, you swap these two terms for each other. This goes here and this goes here. You make this a negative of what it was before. And you multiply by this times this minus this times this, which is this. So in other words, we swap these two terms on the diagonal. We've made the off-diagonal terms negative, And we've multiplied by a term which is um, this times this minus this times this, which is exactly what this term is. It appears to be the determinant of the Jacobian. This is just 1 over the determinant. And that's the term we've been using. And so we can get this. All that matters is that we can get this term here. Uh, if we get this term here, then we can get the magnitudes. Uh, yeah, then, then we can make this transformation. So we want to get the gradients of head related to nodal values of head. If we link these two nodal values of head to global gradients, by definition, it's this A matrix. Right, by definition. So this has to be the A matrix. Um, we know how to get the J matrix in terms of these terms. And uh, yeah, we can do everything. So once we put together this, uh, the Jacobian matrix, and of course the Jacobian, we get all of these terms, dx, dr, and dx, ds, are just the noble coordinates multiplied by this. <coughs> in the same way, d y dr and dy ds are going to be equal to what? They're going to be equal to py. All, right. All we've turned is here and here, and therefore this and this. And so you'll note that these terms here are just the terms that populate these two components, so we can get them. You know, it's a bit uh, all over the place. And so we have everything we need. So we know now that we can get everything. So the equation down at the bottom, as we run out of time, is we need a value of the A matrix. We've absolutely got the A matrix in terms of this. And these are the derivatives of the shape functions. These are the partial derivatives that we've just spent a whole bunch of time figuring out. We know how to get these in terms of the shape functions. So this, these are all determined. Uh, so likewise, we have this. The constitutive matrix isn't changed in any way. And now we have a real definition of what this stretching or, or compressing parameter is that allows us to take the, the global element and make it into the local element by stretching, stretching it or squeezing it. It's just the, the product of these individual derivatives. If we only had a one-dimensional problem, then we'd only have coordinates x and r, and the only thing that we'd have is this, right? And this is exactly the definition of the Jacobin we had before. It links us between these global and local systems. There is x and r only, and that's the definition. If we have two coordinate systems, then we have some extra terms in there that we have to deal with, but it's the same deal. We're out of time, but let's just um, talk about exactly what, what this physically means. Um, yeah, okay. So the, this Jacobian term here, what are the, the physical components? What happened? So the physical components are so. Uh, why don't you do this as a thought exercise for yourself? So say you have a global element which looks like this, which is ten by ten on side, and the mapping function or the mapping element that we use is two by two, right? What are the terms going to be that live in this determinant? 
Come on in. Almost. Ah, there's a trick. <laughs> so x is 10, r is 2. What's y and s? y is 10, s is 2. It's going to be 10 over 2. What's y and r? y is 10, but r is 2, but they're orthogonal. They have no component in each direction. And so this is 0, and this is 0. And so the determinant of Jacobian <coughs> ends up being 5 times 5, which is 25, which is the scaling of the areas between these, I think, right? So this is 2 times 2, which is 4. This is 10 times 10, which is 100. <coughs> 4 goes into 125 times. So it just scales the approximate areas. And so it's good to get a physical representation of all of these things. So we've gone through that a bit quickly. And so I think maybe uh, there are previous videos, if some things are a bit sketchy, that's always the case that I belabor something early on, which I think I belabored the integration, and then had a little less time to talk about the, the manipulation. I'm not sure how important this is for you, depending on how you want, how deep you want to get into this, but it has a very physical meaning of what these terms are. We want to be able to evaluate the uh, conductance matrix. Um, it's on a complicated geometry. We need it in terms of the global gradients, but we can calculate them only in terms of local gradients on this transform mesh. If we calculate on the transform mesh, we can always scale it back to the global mesh using this transformative, transformational property, which is just this stretching or squeezing variable, and you can see exactly what it physically means. If you're so inclined, you can also think about what the individual terms would be on this for this particular case. I think in this case, you'll find that the terms on the leading diagonal exist. They're finite and positive. The terms on the off diagonal, actually for the Jacobian, not this, the terms on the off diagonal are zeros because the x and y coordinates and the r and s coordinates are exactly aligned. If they're 90 degrees off, they would be something else. So you can think about it in those terms.